Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting of the Housing Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Hausman. Present. Howard. Present. Tice. Present. Dick Badgett. Present. Bliss. Present. Gomez. Present. Hassan. Hassan is present. Heinrich. Present. Her. Present. Jurgens. Jurgens present. Olson. Present. Barr. Present. And Ryer. Present. And Madam Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next order of business is approval of the minutes from Thursday, March 18. Representative Howard, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, Madam Chair, so moved. Representative Howard moves approval of the minutes. Any discussion? Uh, members, unmute yourselves for a voice vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Uh, today we have <coughs> Representative Howard uh, with House File 1971. Um, Representative Howard, would you like to move that motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that House File 1971 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Taxes. Representative Howard, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, you may remember this bill. Uh, it was authored by Representative Tabke two years ago. Uh, it is the Affordable Tax Credit uh, Bill. Uh, it's something that we've talked about over the last few sessions. It has bipartisan support, um, I think in part because of the way uh, that it addresses our affordable housing crisis uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and at the outset, I just want to remind committee uh, members of something we know all too well, that Minnesota faces an affordable housing crisis with pressures and needs all across the spectrum of housing. Uh, and what I would submit to this committee is that unless we're willing to think outside of the box, be innovative, try new things, and make new kinds of investments, we will never meet this moment. And we're in a moment right now. Uh, that we must seize to, uh, to address our affordable housing crisis uh, so that Minnesotans uh, and our state really can succeed into the future. And that's what I believe House File 1971 offers for us, an innovative new tool that encourages local businesses and neighbors to invest in their community by creating housing opportunities. Uh, Minnesota needs sources of predictable and sustainable funding for the development of affordable housing. And this tax credit leverages participation from the private market grows the number of stakeholders invested and engaged in affordable housing and build support for local development. Uh, the impact of this credit will be to stimulate affordable home production, especially for the lowest income Minnesotans and target public dollars where the market is not working. Uh, importantly, this target is flexible uh, and can support home ownership, multifamily development and deeper affordability. Uh, this uh, model is not new, although it would be new for Minnesota. Many other states have employed this successfully, this approach, uh, and our bill is modeled after a North Dakota law that's been in place since 2011 that has leveraged roughly $5 for every $1 invested, uh, creating more than uh, 2,500 homes in North Dakota. In exchange for contributions to a specific development or the general loan pool, participating taxpayers would receive a 90 cent uh, per dollar credit against their state tax liability uh, providing resources, flexible resources to meet Minnesota's housing needs all across the state. Uh, I'll turn it over to my testifier soon, but just wanted to again cl uh, close by reflecting on this bill's place uh, in terms of our overall efforts this session uh, to address housing. Um, of course, this committee has been very focused on uh, funding through the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and, and other avenues. But we really need to look at the whole spectrum of state government, including how our tax code operates. I would uh, argue that currently our tax code uh, subsidizing, subsidizes housing, but not necessarily the kinds of needs uh, facing us in this affordable housing crisis. And so this is a step in the right direction, an innovative step, um, and one that I think uh, on a bipartisan basis we can and should take to address our affordable housing crisis. With that, Madam Chair, I would turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you. Um, we have three testifiers. The first one is Ann Navity from the Minnesota Housing Partnership. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. 
Thank you so much. My name is Ann Mavity. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Housing Partnership that works to inform uh, the discussions around affordable housing through research and helps advance policies and investments to make that happen. Um, thank you so much for having us today, Madam Chair and the committee. Uh, I am testifying today in support of uh, House File 1971. Uh, the Minnesota Affordable Housing Tax Credit. Um, I'll just note a couple key things and then I'm available for questions. One is, as uh, Representative Howard noted, uh, MHP has just documented through our State of the State's Housing Report for 2021 that we need more housing of every kind in every corner of Minnesota. Um, and that is particularly uh, a challenge when we're talking about extremely low income families. We currently have a gap of more than 105,000 homes for our extremely low income families. Um, that's what we need to build against just to keep up with this year over year population growth. Um, and as you all are very familiar with, the state has a goal of creating 300,000 new units of housing by 2021 just to keep up with this population growth. Um, and so this becomes a key tool to work toward that goal. So why an affordable housing tax credit? One, when you look at a lot of other uh, sectors, like tra transportation, there are seven dedicated sources of revenue that help fund transportation. More is needed, but there are already dedicated revenue sources. Right now, housing doesn't have any. And so this becomes a really critical tool in this dedicated and predictable housing stream. Affordable housing development needs predictability because investments in site acquisition um, and other kinds of costs happen long before funding applications are submitted or certainly before projects actually open for families. And so the pipeline and capacity of the industry depends on predictable funding, which this would provide. The other thing I would say is that this is different than an appropriation. We are really trying to incent behavior. as. Uh, Representative Howard said, trying to engage more folks in this affordable housing conversation. So whether it's the business community that's working together in Purim that wants to together help um, provide support for affordable housing or a faith group working on a housing development in Plymouth, this provides a way to extend participation in a public-private partnership um, that goes deep into the community. So, uh, and as uh, also Representative Howard noted, this works. This is a proven model in different communities. Um, I'll draw your attention to the handout in your packet or that's uh, listed here that says 2021 tax credit and it speaks specifically to the number of units it can leverage, the number of families it can impact. Um, but with that, I'll just end here and just say I'm open to uh, questions as they may arise. Thank you for your testimony. And <clears throat> now we have Jonathan Weinhagen from the Minneapolis uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for having me today. I am Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. We represent uh, nearly 2,300 members across the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. Uh, businesses are <coughs> rightfully concerned about the lack of affordable homes in Minnesota. It's one of the reasons that the Minneapolis Regional Chamber Board elevated housing and housing affordability to a top tier issue three years ago. And as we've seen over the course of the last year with the pandemic, um, that you know, urgency has grown um, across our region and across our state. Um, a recent report from the Itasca Project, a CEO roundtable that I participate in, really began to frame the, the topic of housing affordability. And I'm gonna share, um, it opens with a sentiments about the region that I share every day. In fact, it's part of all of my talking points. And it says that the Minneapolis-St. Paul region is home to over 3 million residents, 16 Fortune 500 businesses, world-class colleges and universities, renowned park systems, and a vibrant art and music scene. And that over the past decade, the region has enjoyed steady population and economic growth, and its unemployment rate has consistently been lower than the national average. It follows that up by saying, the relative affordability of housing has been an important driver of these outcomes, but that driver is now at risk. Even before the current pandemic and related economic crises, recent decreases in housing affordability threatened the success of the region. I wanna pause there. Not could threaten, not might threaten, not possibly in the future will threaten, threaten the success of the region. 
And that's what we're here to talk about today. And it's why the Minneapolis Regional Chamber supports the affordable housing tax credit as a mechanism that promotes public private partnership, using public resources to leverage private investments and private participation is an approach that we believe is smart. It's good government. It's good for business. It's good for our community and it's good for Minnesota. HF 1971 creates the exact infrastructure that we need, the tax credit to build these relationships between the public and private sectors around housing, something that we don't have today, but something that Representative Howard framed has been successful elsewhere. Um, we've seen in North Dakota, a, a $5 return on investment for every dollar invested. Um, you know, I'm a business guy and the stakeholders that I represent uh, certainly are looking at return on investment. That is a no brainer with regards to, to thinking about the future of the, the housing ecosystem. We know that without adequate housing, businesses can't grow. And in fact, as we leverage towards an economic recovery, we could actually lose ground um, in our state and our region against our competitive peer set. We know that workers need housing, specifically housing that is affordable to their income. So we're talking about housing affordability across all spectrums of the continuum. Um, it's needed to recruit and retain our workforce. Candidly, it is needed for our economic success moving into the future. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't note that housing is a critical race equity issue for Minnesotans and for Minnesota businesses. We know that we need to support black indigenous people of color and immigrants um, and their workers. Our lack of housing investment, particularly affordable housing um, has a race-based history and a current race-based disparities and discrimination. And again, I will point to those disparities being exacerbated in the last 12 months during this pandemic and this economic crisis. Um, so I couldn't urge you more to, to consider moving forward HF 1971 with the full support of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber, our stakeholders in the business community. We think it's a, a smart and pragmatic approach to addressing this critical piece of our economic ecosystem that is housing. Um, so with that, I will also uh, be available to stand for questions, but really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with you today. Thank you for your testimony. And now we are joined by Miranda uh, Walker from the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, my name is Miranda Walker and I've worked in affordable housing uh, for over 10 years now, both as a developer of affordable multifamily housing uh, and currently as senior loan officer at Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. And I'm testifying support of House File 1971 um, creating the Minnesota Affordable Housing Tax Credit. Um, tax credits are, are a much needed source of equity in deals um, that would otherwise uh, not be completed, not be built uh, if without this equity source. Um, right now, um, right now doing this work, doing affordable housing development, lending to affordable housing developers requires a dedicated source of, of revenue for this housing. Uh, right now, the market does not provide enough housing. Uh, additional equity is needed to inject into these projects that serve community needs. Uh, we have an increasingly stratified economy that has created a decent supply of housing for folks that are high income, high income households, folks able to pay high rents, a shrinking supply of housing for folks in the middle, um, and a dearth of housing for low-income households where wages are not keeping up with rent demands. Uh, many low-wage workers can't access safe, decent, affordable housing, uh, and this need uh, constrains business growth as businesses are unable um, to hire folks because folks can't find, find housing. In addition, the increased cost of providing housing, um, both the labor and the materials that we hear so much about, means that even the impact of existing housing credits uh, is shrinking. So to ensure that projects work well for local communities, developers, uh, lenders, folks who are in this space need flexible, uh, a flexible and simple financial tool that will allow them to develop affordable housing and specifically affordable housing that meets local needs. Uh, uh, this, this tax credit, the addition of this tax credit can be used to support home ownership, uh, certainly multifamily, the space that I operate in, uh, for new projects, for existing projects, for rehab, to create deeper affordability in projects. Um, for example, folks at 60% AMI making rents than affordable people who earn 50% of area median income. 
these tax credits also allow for diversification of product type. Um, it allows developers to be responsive to specific community needs. Um, for example, as a developer, I've worked on projects that have required uh, both uh, design and programmatic flexibility uh, to meet community needs, to provide an aesthetic that fits within an existing community's fabric, to provide specific space for veterans, specific social space to serve folks, kids who are aging out of foster care. Um, much of my work right now with Greater Minnesota Housing Fund uh, is with rural developers, and there's a very specific need right now in Greater Minnesota for an affordable tax credit. Um, we're small projects um, because these areas can't support large 150 plus unit housing uh, where the federal tax credit, federal LIHTC really just isn't uh, a strong enough or large enough tool. Um, and in addition to, to echo some of the comments made earlier, uh, this tax credit really is needed to provide investment communi communities that have experienced historic disinvestment and specifically in communities of color um, where there has been a real lack of both public and private investment. So thank you for, for your time and your attention. Um, my colleagues at Greater Minnesota Housing Fund strongly support uh, this tax credit for Minnesota. We've analyzed the potential impact of this credit. Uh, funded at $25 million, this tax credit would help provide 1,700 homes, create between um, 325 and 700 new homes and create deeper affordability um, for a thousand homes. Um, so I encourage your and your support on on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, members, we uh, will go to member questions now if, if there are members uh, for the uh, questions of the author or the testifiers. Mr. Worth, do we have questions? And Madam Chair, Representative Ryer has a question. Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is for um, Mr. Weinhagen. Um, first of all, I just want to say that personally, I'm fully committed to building uh, across the spectrum, especially focusing on the need for affordable housing and the desperate shortage that we have in the state. And I'm actively pushing on that um, in a number of ways, including through bonding, uh, but love that we're talking about having a portfolio of tools and different ways to accomplish this. I think it's a really uh, creative and uh, sensible approach. My question is, um, I do encounter both uh, constituents and colleagues who are skeptical about the return on investment. So when you said, return on uh, investment is a no brainer. Um, my ears pricked right up and I thought, well, do you have data? Do you have um, evidence uh, on any aspects? And I, I, I would extend this also to the other testifiers. For me, one of the most useful things I can have is more ways to tell the story, uh, data for people who are data people, uh, stories for people who are story people, but it's easier to find stories than really solid, strong, hard data. Thank you. I think that uh, question was for Mr. Weinhagen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Breyer. It's a, it's a great question. What I will point to is um, the beauty of this tax credit is uh, you know, as much as we like to innovate here in the state of Minnesota, um, it's not a new idea. It has been operationalized and implemented in other marketplaces. So North Dakota is the one that we point to as kind of a, a gold standard. Um, and, and that's where we have that data where they are leveraging $5 in private investment for every dollar in public investment. Um, so when we talk about that return on investment, it's not a projection. It's not something that we think might possibly happen if we deploy it here. It's something we've seen happen um, in a neighboring state. And I think you can confidently go forward and share that with constituents and those who, who share what is probably a healthy skepticism um, but one that I'm really confident um, with regards to, to this legislation is going to yield every bit um, as much return on investment as we've seen in our neighbor in North Dakota. Follow up, Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would just ask that if we could get um, help from staff to find access to that information, um, or if Mr. Reinhagen would have any information for background, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up on that uh, request. Mr. Worth, other questions? Madam Chair, Representative Jurgens has a question. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
Representative Howard, I just want to make sure I understand how, how this would work. So if let's say I owe the state of Minnesota $100 at the end of the tax year, uh, and I, I can donate $100 to um, the, Lord, I donate Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and get a $90 credit for that. So in the end, I instead of owing the state $100, I owe the state $10 and MHFA gets my $90. Is that, is that, did I boil it down correctly? Representative Howard. Madam Chair, I believe so. I, I might, I, uh, I, th I think you've got it. I, I would turn it over to Ms. Mavity if she, if she had it clarifying, but I think that's correct. Yeah. Ms. Mavity, does, did that sound right? That, that is how we understand it as well. Thank you. All right. Just need Representative clarification. Durgis. I'm, I'm not, I'm not the brightest bulb, so I, I just want to make <laughs> sure I understood it. Good to clarify. Uh, other questions, Ms. Worth? Yes, Madam Chair. Representative Tice has a question. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple questions just about getting the program going. I'm seeing that it'll start at the end of the year. Um, both the fun, both the uh, everything. Uh, is that enough time? Representative Howard, uh, do you have an answer to that or go to one of the testifiers? Madam Chair, I, I would just mention, of course, sometimes we pass a bill and its enactment is right after um, we pass it sometimes it, it sets to july um uh and so you know having having some runway here makes sense but i i will i don't have for you information about how quickly things got moving in north dakota or some of the other states perhaps one of my testifiers could comment on sort of the the setup any of the testifiers or our research staff miss mavity has got her hand up Ms. <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative Tice, what I would say is that um, this idea has been in formulation uh, for several years, and we have had uh, fairly in-depth conversations with uh, staff at Minnesota Housing and others to really explore what that implementation looks like. Um, certainly, setting it up uh, is important and making sure it functions well, but it's not an overly complicated setup. It's designed to uh, be fairly straightforward. So, uh, so those conversations have begun uh, a year or two ago with Minnesota Housing. Um, obviously, there's a lot on their plate and we would need to continue to do that, but we think that this could be de deployed relatively quickly. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And how long has North Dakota been doing this? Ms. Babidi, do you have an answer to that? You know, I, I am so sorry. I will get the exact date, but I believe it's been about uh, five, six years. Uh, 2011. No, it's been 10 years. Excuse me. 2011. Okay. Oh, well, that's right. We talked. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's right. Uh, you kind of mentioned uh, 2011 before, and I right away I'm thinking, well, that was the recession time, great time to do it. And I know they were having some things go on there as well. But um, you know, I really think it's a good idea and I love out of the box ideas and I think it is. Uh, I'm still not sure I'm I'm 100% on how the process works. So, well, and, and how are we gonna get the word out, I guess is my biggest thing. How do we get the word out to people that they can do this? Um, who's, uh, I'm looking for a, a hand, who, who might be open to that question? Rips of Howard. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Tice, that's a good question. I think we can work with Minnesota Housing. And then again, as sort of Mr. Weinhagen uh, mentioned, we can lean on some other states. Uh, I mean, I think this is an area where we can uh, uh, find out what has worked well in other places to sort of get the word out and maximize uh, the investment. But I, what I would say is just based on what's happening in the marketplace around housing, I don't know if getting the word out is gonna be the challenge. The, the need is so great that that my, my anticipation like so much in our housing, uh, once something like this is out there, uh, the challenge might be on the other side, uh, more people wanting to utilize it than, than dollars made available. Representative Tice. Madam Chair, and I think that's what I'm thinking of, you know, if, if I want to donate, you know, how do we, how do we get that word out that it's even available to folks to do this, to get that fund to grow? And maybe it's just, we just need to advocate for it and put it out there. But uh, I, I'm really, kind of excited and I'm, are we gonna find out how, what the fiscal note is after it goes to taxes? Do we see it again? Representative Howard. 
Madam Chair, this bill uh, has a cost of $25 million per year of the credit. That's what uh, we have prescribed now. It, it will go to taxes. And um, so it, at least in its current form, uh, that's the amount of dollars we're allocating for it. Uh, this okay. bill is also traveling in the Senate. Uh, the Senate tax chair, Senator Nelson, is the chief author of this bill. I believe it's set funded at $25 million in the Senate as well. Okay. That's, thank you, Madam Chair. That helps a lot. And uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, Mr. Worth, I don't see any other. You have any other questions? Madam Chair, no other questions. Okay. Um, Representative Howard, final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll echo what Representative Tice said. I'm excited about this. Uh, this is the kind of innovation we need to see in housing if we're gonna meet the moment uh, that's presented to us. And I would encourage uh, bipartisan support as we move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with that, I will renew my motion uh, that 1971 uh, be recommended to pass and we refer to the Committee on Taxes. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? Aye. McBadget? Aye. Bliss? Excused. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? Aye. Olson? Aye. Farr? Aye. And Ryer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is 11 ayes and one nay. There being uh, 11 ayes and one nay, the motion prevails and the bill is passed. Um, Representative Howard, on to your next, on to your next bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my next bill uh, and where's my house file number? 2229. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. House, I will move that house file 2229 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Taxes. Ms. Howard moves uh, House File 2229 be recommended to be passed and be referred to the Committee on Taxes. Representative Howard, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a bill uh, that I conjured uh, for better or worse, uh, based on the conversations that we've had in this committee and in taxes um, about, in particular, about our gaps in equity as it relates to homeownership. And I really view this bill as a chance for us to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, if, we're, or if we're going to um, truly do something to make sure that our public dollars that we use are reflective of the, the gaps in equity in terms of home ownership in particular. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, we've had more conversations about this in taxes, but uh, we currently subsidize home ownership in Minnesota through our tax code, although we largely uh, use those resources to subsidize the uh, uh, larger and wealthier homes through the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, currently in Minnesota, uh, folks can, can deduct their mortgage interest deduction on homes up to $750,000. It used to be up to a million dollars and some, uh, uh, some of those homes have been grandfathered in at that level. Uh, based in recent tax changes in the, the federal Trump tax bill, there was changes that actually uh, made it so that more folks would take standard deductions, but it actually uh, made the mortgage interest deduction something that's even further skewed uh, towards larger homes and larger interest deductions. And one, the, the piece in particular that this bill calls attention to is that uh, the mortgage interest deduction is actually able to be utilized for folks um, who purchase their second home. Uh, so uh, someone may have $750,000 in mortgages over two homes, they might receive a 30, 40,000 tax break as a result. So that's one side of the home ownership and how we're spending about $100 million a year uh, in, in public resources to subsidize home ownership largely for larger homes. Meanwhile, let's look at the other side of home ownership. That's the side that we've spent more time talking about uh, in this committee, uh, that thousands upon thousands of Minnesotans are struggling to afford their first home. Uh, home prices are going up, uh, making it even harder for folks. 
uh, rents are going up. And we know we have one of the largest uh, gaps, uh, racial equity gaps, in terms of uh, ability to attain home ownership, just a foundation of building generational wealth. Uh, we do support uh, with state dollars, the ability to help folks find uh, their first time home through the Home Ownership Assistance Fund operated by Minnesota Ho Housing. In 2019, uh, they helped with down payment and closing cost assistance, uh, appropriating about an average of $8,000 to help just over 100 households to attain uh, that key piece. And as I talk to folks in my community, and my guess is it's similar across the state, uh, uh, there's so many folks that they're actually paying more in rent uh, than would be their mortgage uh, because of how rent has skyrocketed. Yet it's that down payment, that ability to have enough resources to put that money down to purchase their home that is the key stumbling block. And currently, data supports that over 60,000 renter households of color in Minnesota have the income they need to potentially buy a home and are within the prime home buying age range, uh, but simply don't have the income to make that down payment. And so let me just call and say that again, we're currently helping 100 households a year with public dollars uh, secure that down payment. Meanwhile, 60,000 renters uh, have the means, they're paying the rent, but uh, we are not providing them the public assistance. And so what this bill says essentially, uh, or would do would eliminate the ability uh, for the mortgage interest deduction to be taken out for a second home. And it would apply those revenues uh, to the Minnesota home ownership uh, program. And again, it basically we're, we're saying something that I think should be simple uh, and should be right and just that in terms of our public tax dollars, let's not give a Minnesotan a tax break on their second home uh, before we provide someone uh, resources, the ability to get their first home. Uh, so really this is a, a racial equity bill to focus a huge gap in Minnesota where we have one of the worst gaps in terms of home ownership. And here is a clear and tangible way we can use public resources in a targeted way uh, to support home ownership of those that are struggling to attain that uh, uh, cornerstone of the American dream, so to speak. And with that, Madam Chair, I would uh, turn it over to my testifiers. Okay, we have two testifiers. Julie uh, Guggen, Minnesota Home Ownership Center. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Hello, my name is Julie Guggen. I'm the president of the Minnesota Home Ownership Center. Chair Houseman and members of the committee. The center believes that owning a home is a foundation for personal success. For the last 25 years, we've worked to educate potential home buyers on the complicated process of qualifying for a mortgage, affording down payment and closing costs, and transitioning to sustainable home ownership. We've carried out this work by partnering with more than 40 community-based organizations throughout the state to offer unbiased home buyer advisory services and our home stretch home ownership curriculum. Because home ownership is the main way that households in this country create wealth, we focus our work towards those that have traditionally been left out of the ownership space, households of color and lower income households. Last year, 63% of the households we served represented communities of color and the median, median income of households served was just over $40,000. We know for a fact that Minnesota renters aspire to be homeowners. In a survey conducted by the center in 2019, more than half of respondents indicated that they plan to buy a home within the next five years. But rising home values, declining wages and constrained inventory are creating unprecedented barriers to the achievement of this aspiration, especially for those we work with. And when coupled with historic racism, and lingering systemic bias, we find ourselves living with one of the highest racial homeownership gaps in the country. The ownership gap between white households and households of color in Minnesota is in excess of 50%. This is not acceptable. The center is intent on reversing homeownership injustice and averting the threats posed by homeownership challenges to individual households, our communities and our collective economy. It's in this spirit that I'm here today to speak in support of Representative Howard's bill as it would fund additional monies for homeownership assistance programs 
and allow this important work to be expanded and enhanced. Homeownership education and advising are proven tools that have helped thousands of Minnesota families over the years and effective enhancements can be derived from data. For example, the center just concluded a joint study with the Minnesota Realtors quantifying the impact of potential down payment assistance amounts. We found that after accounting for renter households already able to afford a mortgage transaction, access to down payment assistance could enable more than 200,000 additional Minnesota households to purchase a home. More than half of these could do so with less than $10,500 in assistance. With regard to the state's racial home ownership gap, transitioning just 11,600 black renter households to ownership would increase the black home ownership rate by 10%, a significant achievement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony. And we have uh, Paul Eager from the Minnesota Realtors. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Paul Eager, and I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. We're a statewide business trade association with a membership of over 21,000 real estate professionals working with buyers and sellers in every corner of the state. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts uh, with you today regarding Representative Howard's House File 2229. But we appreciate Representative Howard's efforts to find revenue to support the Home Ownership Assistance Program and the goal of helping more Minnesotans get into home ownership. Minnesota Realtors respectfully opposes the funding source identified in this bill, which would limit the mortgage interest deduction to the interest paid on a principal residence, excluding interest on any other property such as a cabin. The seasonal recreational property market is important to the greater Minnesota economy. Our members, particularly those who live and work in greater Minnesota, are concerned about the potential impact this bill may have on the housing markets, local economies and areas with a lot of seasonal recreational properties. Cabin owners pay local property taxes that support local services, including schools and roads. According to a Star Tribune article dated November 16, 2017, at the time there were 10 counties in Minnesota where cabin owners shouldered more than 40% of the residential property tax burden. And in several counties, cabin owners shouldered more than 50%. The share of the property tax burden um, Cabin owners pay in some communities shields owners of homesteads and other types of property from paying significantly higher property taxes. In addition, cabin owners also pay the state general levy, which is the state property tax on commercial industrial and seasonal recreational property. Those dollars go into the state general fund. Lastly, I just wanna emphasize that Minnesota competes with other states and other countries to attract people to live, work and recreate in Minnesota. In our treatment, Minnesota's current treatment of interest on second home mortgages matches the federal tax treatment of that interest. But we certainly are not claiming that this proposal will put an end to the market for cabins. This bill would add to the cost of owning property in Minnesota and will be factored into the decision making of current and prospective cabin owners. If there's a drop in cabin ownership, the impact will be felt most directly in those counties where cabin owners pay a significant share of property taxes and where local businesses rely on spending by seasonal residents. And Madam Chair, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and, and just wanna echo uh, Ms. Guggen's comments on the work that we've been engaged with with the center uh, regarding the importance of down payment assistance and look forward to sharing more of that research that we've done over the past year with, with you and the members of this committee and the other body in, in the very near future. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Howard, do you have any more comments before we go to questions? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I think we go to questions. I could okay. um, hit, hit my closing uh, response. Okay, questions yeah. um, for the bill author or the testifiers? Mr. Wirth, I don't see any hands right now. Madam Am Chair, I... Representative Tice does have a question. Oh, Representative Tice. Oh, I see the hand now. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make a comment and kind of uh, reiterate what what Mr. I'm sorry, Edgar said, because um, as somebody that owns a property, our cabin's 400 square feet, we pay $1,200, and that goes to the Richmond School District, the Prairie School District, and the surrounding area. And uh, I, it's, it's probably 
three fourths of what we pay on our home in St. Cloud on the south side. And that district is 742. So we do see a lot of folks out there and it doesn't, it's a lot for 400 square feet. And we do own the lot as well. But I guess, can you explain the effective date to me for a little, a little bit? So this would be part of our 2021 taxes. Um, probably Representative Howard. Representative Howard. Madam Chair, I might defer to House Research staff on the effective Do we have uh, House um, Research impact. staff available for that question? Uh, Chair Hausman? Uh, Who's? Uh, Sean Williams from House Sean Research. Sean Williams. Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Hausman and members, uh, so I believe the bill is effective for taxable years um, beginning after December 31st. Uh, 2020, that's sort of a typical uh, taxes effective date. So that would just be on your 2021 taxes, which are filed and paid in 2022. Rupert Tice. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I just don't think that's a lot of time. Um, I know the, the need is urgent, I get that. But that's that could be a huge deal for a lot of folks. And as Mr. Egger said, I think it could be sometimes a deal breaker for folks buying properties. Um, it is huge, but just, I'm just thinking, trying to think really desperately here. So my son owns a home and we are on that loan. What does that mean for me? Does it mean anything at all? And I guess maybe if there's somebody here, maybe even uh, Representative Farr could tell me, does this affect anything that I currently own with like my son? Or is this just something that uh, we own solely? Thank you. Representative Farr. Uh, to Madam Chair, to, uh, I, I don't have an answer to uh, Representative okay. Tice's question. I am not certain of that and, and have, uh, I guess, some of those questions myself um, when you're done, Representative Tice. Representative Tice. Thank you, Mr. Farr. And, and maybe we'll just, or, Representative Farr, maybe we'll just, I guess I have concerns about that. If I buy another property for whatever reason, um, or my name is on another property, say something happens to my parents, uh, how does how does that affect, affect that property? Thank you. I don't know, Mr. Williams, if you have a, an answer to that or? Uh, Chair Houseman and Representative Tice. So it would depend if you're paying mortgage interest on that property, whether and also whether or not you are an itemizer. Uh, so if you itemize your deductions for the state purposes. So if you itemize your deduction, deductions for state purposes, uh, then you'd be presumably uh, using the mortgage interest to deduction to deduct any mortgage interest paid. Under current law, you get uh, to deduct mortgage interest on your principal residence and one other residence designated by the taxpayer. Um, so depending on whether or not you're paying interest on another uh, mortgage that you uh, might, might be a uh, part of, uh, then uh, potentially you might lose the ability to direct the interest on uh, uh, on that loan if you've paid. Any follow-up, Representative Tice? Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Farr, to your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to the to the bill's author, so what is, what is federal tax code in this area and what other states in the upper Midwest uh, have this mortgage interest, um, you know, what we're proposing here. Representative Howard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the, as it relates to federal policy changes, I alluded to this in my comments, but changes were made to the mortgage interest deduction um, uh, in, the, in the Trump uh, tax bill in which the, uh, uh, the amount of mortgage that you're able to deduct was dropped from a million to 750,000. There was also changes to the standard deduction um, that greatly uh, uh, increased the number of folks that would be taking the standard deduction versus itemizing. That's had the impact of, um, I think you're, you're gonna see in terms of just a financial perspective, it's gonna be folks that have a larger percentage of uh, their uh, resources in terms of in deducting their interest, uh, mortgage interest uh, that would be utilizing this versus a larger group of folks uh, before uh, the, the Trump tax bill. I do know that there are certain properties that were grandfathered in at that million dollar 
uh, threshold, depending on when folks um, had purchased their uh, home. Uh, in terms of other states that have, uh, what are they, how they interact? Uh, I'm not certain if other states are pursuing this exact policy um, or how many states are pegged exactly to the federal government. Group so far. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Worth, do I have, a, am I missing any hands? Oh, Representative Gomez has her. Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to thank Representative Howard, Howard for his work on this bill. Um, you know, I think as he really outlined very well, um, fewer and fewer people are doing itemized deductions on their taxes um, since the doubling of the standard deduction as part of the TCJA in 2017. And, this actually and so this is really like, <clears throat> um, so that means that you know, more and more the investment that we're making. And we do need to think of tax breaks as investments. We need to think of this, you know, 80 to $100 million that we spend each year subsidizing high income homeowners. That's who, that's who takes this, right? High income homeowners. And in this case, we're just talking about high income, the highest income homeowners who own a second home, who own a cabin. So, so we're, subsidizing those folks while while there are all of these people who have not had the opportunity to to develop to, to buy a home to develop that that wealth for their families who are systematically um you know excluded from that opportunity and so and so what i really love about this bill is that it just it does that directly right it directly addresses the distortion that we with our public policy choices are up are upholding you know, we have a situation in this country where the average household wealth of a white family is 10 times that of a black family. And this is because of generations of, you know, de facto and de jure discrimination and extraction of wealth and racial terrorism in our country. And, and so, you know, I just, I think this is really one of those examples where, you know, the way that we think, we, we like to think of our tax code as being like, neutral and colorblind, but when we have policies that uphold racial inequities that are that are the reality, our, our policies cannot be thought of as neutral. Our policies cannot be thought of as race blind. Our policies can be need to be thought of as as upholding inequity, upholding the deepest racial inequity or one of them in uh, in home ownership in the country. So I'm just really thankful for this work and I think this is a good bill. I hope that we will pass it on to the tax committee. Thank you. Um, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair. I'm, I'm looking at the bill language. Representative Gomez said several times that this is a tax break for the, the, the most wealthy, for uh, wealthiest Minnesotans. I don't see an income level on here. Is, is, did I miss something? Because uh, this is for anybody that owns two properties. Somebody that, owns, that makes $50,000 a year that owns a home and a cabin would they would qualify for this this tax as it is today correct it's not there isn't an income li limit on there is that correct mr uh, representative howard represent howard madam chair uh the uh, the reason as we've heard sort of discussed in large part because of the changes at the federal level to the standard deduction um we're talking for folks to be uh for it to be a financially in your benefit to, to itemize and to take the mortgage interest deduction, it is far more likely um, you're gonna be on the upper end of that uh, 700, you know, uh, the $750,000 limit that folks can, and plus we're applying this just to your second home. So while the, the um, there's no income limits per se in the bill, the way it is structured, um, and the sort of standard operating procedure for who would be uh, taking this deduction, uh, it is definitely skewed uh, towards uh, more uh, wealthier homeowners uh, or more wealthier homeowners that have more than one homes. Representative Jurgens. But with this bill, we would be taking away that option from even low income uh, individuals that, that own two properties. Madam Chair. Representative Howard. One, I don't know how many low, I mean, I guess it de depends on your definition of low. Lower, I'm not, lower. Sure. Uh, um, 
I would, what I would say though, is I think, and you could follow up offline and, and try to do some analysis, but again, because of the doubling of the standard deduction, um, you know, this is definitely a tax provision that's weighted uh, not towards lower. Um, it's not even weighted towards middle. It's uh, weighted towards higher income folks um, who have more than one homes. I'm, right, I'm guessing you'll have more conversation about that in the tax committee too. Representative Jurgens, follow up. No, thank you for the information. Um, Mr. Worth, am I missing, missing any hands? Madam Chair, I see no hands at this time. Okay. Um, Representative Howard, final comments. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And Representative Gomez gave a pretty good closing for me. Um, <laughs> The, but what I would what I would say is uh, one thing Mr. Egger talked about uh, you know impact with folks having cabins. I will say you know I grew up in an area where a lot of folks had cabins, um, and I would just how Minnesotans operate. I would be surprised if uh, based on this tax change, uh, wealthier Minnesotans that have two homes would just decide okay, or well, I'm not going to have a cabin anymore. I I don't think that is a uh, market. Uh, impact that is likely. Um, but besides that, the question for all of uh, us, all of us, as we vote on this proposal today, is about a policy choice that, that is before us with limited public resources. Do we think it is a good idea to give a tax break for someone on their second home up to uh, $750,000 in, in mortgage interest uh, before we're uh, giving a using public resources to help someone secure their very first home, their path into home ownership. That's the choice that's presented to us before this bill, and I hope that uh, we will make the right one, uh, Madam Chair. Would you like to renew your motion? Yes, Madam Chair. I will move uh, that House file. My goodness, what's <laughs> what's my bill number again? Twenty-two twenty-nine. Uh, House file twenty-two twenty-nine. Uh, be recommended to pass and be referred to the taxes committee. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative Howard uh, renews his motion that House File 2229 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the committee on taxes. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Houseman? Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? No. Egg Badger? Aye. Bliss? No. Gomez? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Heinrich? No. Her? Aye. Jurgens? No. Olson? Aye. Farr? No. And Ryer? Aye. Madam Chair, that is eight ayes and five nays. There being eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and the bill is passed. Members, our next meeting will be uh, Tuesday, April 6, at which time we intend to have the rollout of the Housing Omnibus Bill DE Amendment and we'll take public testimony on our budget bill. Uh, there being no other business before us, we are adjourned. <laughs>